Thanks so much for having me. My name is Ben Christensen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cambium Carbon. I beat the often path by creating circular economies in U.S. cities. So really excited to be here and, and to be talking today. Have you ever been walking in a city and you just happen to see a tree or two sandwiched in between all of the gray concrete stores that you love? No, you never really noticed them. Well, believe it or not, not a whole lot of people have historically been paying much attention to urban trees or what happens to them before or after they die. Like an Instagram creator with only 1,000 followers, trees are the unsung heroes of this world, doing their thing for an audience of pizza crusts and mostly rats. Okay, some of us love urban trees, it's true, and I'm one of them, but these trees decay, they die, often of natural causes, but sometimes via misinformation spread on Facebook. Then what? Now, I'm not suggesting you go out and hug a tree today, because that would be weird, right? But what I am gonna do is tell you about a problem and a man named Ben Christensen with a very inventive solution to that problem. Of course, first, why should you give a shit at all about trees? Why should you give a shit? It's research time, so let's dive into this week's notes. The EPA says, in 2017, Americans generated 18 million tons of wood waste from residential, commercial, and institutional sources. And as for trees specifically, urban trees, varying in growth rate, species, and size, are a challenge for traditional sawmills to process and sort. Both in Michigan and across the United States, dead urban trees are usually treated as trash, and they end up in landfills burned, dumped on private land, or left to decay in woodlots. That's from a piece on EESI.org, and it's pretty representative of the level of thought that's gone into urban trees up until now. Because the disposal of dead, unsound, or unwanted urban trees is often seen as a drain on resources and a cost impediment to achieving other program accomplishments. Speaking of a drain on resources and a cost impediment to other program accomplishments, welcome to my show! <coughs> Because this process is seen only as a burden, cities typically respond in very haphazard ways, and that's why many urban trees end up in landfills or chipped or whatever. They're simply given away to anyone who will take care of the problem. But trees do have real value, and throwing that away would be the equivalent of throwing away a perfectly good Fenty beauty kit that you see lying on the ground. It's reckless, and I won't stand for it. But what if, now hear me out because I know this sounds crazy, what if there were a way to capture that value in a smart way? and turn it into usefulness while reducing waste, enriching cities, and aiding in sustainability efforts. Surely something like that would be too good to be true, right? Especially when you consider that every year, 36 million trees come down in cities across the United States due to old age, disease, and new development, resulting in economic losses up to $786 million each year. Much of this wood could become valuable products, but instead often gets chipped, thrown in a landfill, or burned as firewood. Rethinking urban wood waste could be an unexpected climate and economic solution, turning a burden on the climate and city budgets into a financial engine for reforestation across the broader landscape. Now that was written by Todd Gartner and Ben Christensen, two experts on the subject. Now speaking of experts, what if we happen to have Ben Christensen on this show? Wouldn't that be a pretty good podcast guest? Would that make a difference? Well, only one way to find out. Well, I'm really excited too, especially because I have no idea what a circular economy is. So we're off to a great start. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about how goods are traditionally produced, so if you think about pretty much any product you buy, you're getting it from a company that is taking an extractive model. So they're pulling out different input resources for that product. And they're taking that from somewhere. And then they're building a product out of it. And so the core way you can think about it is, they're taking from somewhere, they're selling it to you, sort of full stop. A circular economy model is one where it thinks about bringing those resources in as an input, selling those as products, and then reinvesting in that sort of core input from the beginning. So we add in some additional components of that where our core input is a waste stream. Um, so really trying to save waste, turn it into really valuable and durable products. And then we're really focused on reinvesting in local climate solutions. Um, so we're hoping to create a circular economy that also um, does a lot of additional value as well. Okay. Well, I understood more of that response and every single part of it sounds amazing. That is incredibly cool. So let's back up. Let's go to the beginning. I know that you've been very passionate about the environment for pretty much your whole life. How on earth did you get up to this, involved in this line of work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's there's two big things for me. One is 
addressing climate change in a big way is something that I feel like I can do to really help serve the world. I feel like it's one of the biggest existential issues that we have. And we need as many people as possible really thinking about how we can address it. And in particular, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but addressing it in a real people first way. So for me, it offers this amazing opportunity to not just address and create a planet that we can live in in 2100, but also to address many of the societal inequities that we have um, in our current economy by creating a new and better model. So that's what we want to see. I really started it um, because I grew up in a teeny tiny town in New Mexico, about 200 folks um, up in the mountains and was really seeing pine beetle. Um, so bark beetles came through and devastated our pinon forests, killing lots and lots of trees. So you know, the trees in the forest I grew up in, I saw them really die. That's exacerbated by climate change pests. And that type of input is really damaging to our forest and is made worse by climate change. And so I saw that. And what I recognized is this is a problem that I really, really care about. This is a problem that is you know, unbelievably complicated and, you know, has lots of fascinating solutions and different ways to take that. And so that's how I really started on the journey. I studied it and it's been a, it's been a long road to get to where I am today, but um, have been committed to it for, for a long time. That's incredible. And you know, that actually happened. I'm from Colorado. We witnessed yeah. the same thing. Pine beetle yep. happened, forests thinned out horrible. You could see it. How old were you when you started noticing that? Yeah, I mean, as as soon as I can remember. I okay. mean, I, I pretty much grew, grew up in the woods. I actually was catching up with a high school friend, um, somebody I went to middle school with, and he was saying that we hadn't talked in years. And he was like, I remember sitting down next to you in sixth grade, and the question was, what do you want to do? And your answer was, like, save the environment. And I don't remember that. I don't remember being that, like, thoughtful or having such a clear vision. But it really has been something that, you know, I, I remember being around for for my whole life. And, and the reason that those pine beetles, it's because it doesn't get cold enough in the winter, right? The frost that normally kills them off doesn't. They stick around, they go nuts, kill the trees. Yeah. You know, there's there's lots of complicating factors. And that's, that's always the thing with climate change is it's not just 100% this is caused because of climate change, but it's increasing those probabilities. It's making them happen with way more consistency and way more likelihood. So yeah, it's really driven by that. And mm-hmm. The sort of scale of damage and, and how much it hurts, um, particularly Southwestern forests, um, you know, that's, that's a huge part of it. Fascinating. So it all began with trees yep. and it's still a matter of trees, right? It is, yep. And you went to uh, Yale. So I did, yeah. Explain that. Yeah, so I got my undergrad at um, Cal Poly, San okay. Luis Obispo, just north of you. Had an amazing experience there. Um, really was more focused on sort of technical aspects of climate change. Um, realized that I, you know, was I, I worked at the national labs. I like didn't like working in the laboratory setting. Realized I wanted to be finding solutions that could really be scaled um, and got this opportunity to go to the Yale School of Forestry, really, really learned a ton about the policy and then also the business of it. Um, And I've always been really passionate about starting and building teams. And so wanted to create a solution that was scalable. Um, And for me, that means not just, you know, environmentally scalable, whereas we get bigger, we are better for the planet instead of being worse, but also one that is financially scalable um, so that it allows for that type of growth and the type of sort of catalytic impact that we want to see at a national and a global scale. And to that point, did you always think this is something that I want to bring back to the Southwest or did you start to realize there was a more global issue here? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we named Cambium Cambium because it plays a really important role in a tree. So the cambium, if you can imagine like a tree ring, right? So you can see each of those different growth stages. So that's the cambium layer. The cambium is the growth layer. So it's all about growing. So that's one of our core pieces. And then the other thing that the cambium layer does is it really facilitates nutrient and water exchange between the leaves and the roots. So it's a connector. So it grows and it connects and it connects across different scales, right? It connects from the soil up to the leaves, which are totally different worlds, right? Um, And that's what we're really trying to do and creating a climate solution that can connect across different sectors and different scales. So what does that look like? Well, in terms of sectors, you know, my day, sometimes I'm talking to a local urban wood products miller, somebody who's on the ground every day, you know, cutting wood. And then I jump into a conversation with a city official. um, And then we're talking to, you know, somebody who's looking at, you know, buying some sort of sustainable material from a national scale. And then in terms of bringing sort of these solutions at different scales, you know, it's really about transcending the local and the national and ultimately the international. And so I've always really wanted to 
again, really drive and support resources coming into communities and really enabling communities to make their own decisions about how those resources go. We really don't want to be prescriptive. We want to add in those pieces. And we really want to give them access to these big national um, opportunities. So I've always wanted to bring it back to New Mexico. We do a lot of work in Albuquerque, a lot of work um, in Colorado, We're starting to get some work in Texas as well, which is great. Um, a lot of work in Southern California as well. So it's growing, it's scaling, uh, but it's really exciting to, to get to go home and, and to get to, to provide that value there as well. Uh, I read from your page or one of your pages, American cities. Now, this is the interesting part. Cities lose an average of 36 million trees each year due to factors such as disease or infestation, age, extreme weather, resulting in economic losses up to $786 million annually. So that's cities. And we've been talking about forests up until this point. So what is going on in these cities? Yeah, so... It's a crazy problem, um, and it's one that is really sight unseen. So when you don't think about it, you don't realize it. But for everybody listening, like just start looking around. When you drive, when you walk, look at what happens to trees that are getting cut down in your neighborhood. Um, watch what's happening to that wood, because most of the time that wood is being cut up into really small pieces. It's turned into mulch, um, and oftentimes it's even burned. So it's sent into these really bad pathways for reuse. Uh, or for the climate as well. That happens for a lot of different reasons. um, And that's what we're really trying to address. Um, So the crazy thing there, and as you're highlighting, is more harvestable wood actually falls in our cities every year naturally um, and through plant removal. So as our cities grow, we take down more trees. Um, So that's already happening. That more of that happens in cities than in our national forests, which is a crazy statistic. That's Um, truly mind boggling. It's unbelievable. And most of that wood is being wasted right now. So that 780 million number you're talking about, that's the amount of money that cities are paying to get rid of it. So that's paying to send wood to landfills and in disposal fees to actually get rid of that wood. So we're basically paying to get rid of a resource that we could be using in all of these amazing ways. But there's a lot of hurdles there. And so that's what we really exist as, is to help solve that problem, to make sure we can capture that wood and and turn it into its best use. And best of all, reinvest that into the type of city trees that we really want to see, um, which is going to be really important for you know this next century as our cities get put under more and more pressure from climate change. Hey, Tim, what should we do with that dead tree over there? You mean that useless piece of garbage? Dump it. You don't think it has any value? That old thing? Nah. But it's a tree, boss. I know. Who needs it? Just another hassle with no economic benefit whatsoever. Okay, I'll send it to the landfill again, I guess. Yeah, all right, buddy. Well, I'm off for the day. I gotta go stop by Ikea and go get a dining room table, some chairs, and then I'm gonna go buy some firewood from Home Depot on my way home. I swear, it feels like 50% of every paycheck goes to wood or wood-related products. <laughs> wood. Anywho, see you tomorrow, Billy. See you, boss. And, and how did you go about starting those conversations with officials or the people who had the power to make these kinds of things happen? How did you begin that? Yeah. I mean, one of our core values is is listen first. Um, So we spent a lot of time and continue to spend a lot of time really trying to listen and understand what is the real problem there. Um, So trying rather than saying, oh, this is what we think the problem is. Here's the solution we think you want. Starting first with what really is your problem and getting good about asking the types of question that really open that up. So we spent a lot of time with that initially with cities. We were fortunate enough to get the 2020 TNC Natural Climate Change Solutions Accelerator Grant in partnership with the Arbor Day Foundation to go and do this in a, a number of different cities. So we are releasing our first three real detailed assessments in New York City, Pittsburgh, and Eugene in the next mm-hmm. couple of months, which was exciting. Um, so that really allowed us to do a much deeper dive in a few specific locations. We've now expanded that and are working with a number of cities across the country to really understand what that is. And, you know, the big thing that we've realized is cities are a core part of this, right? We need cities and we need municipal solutions and we need government to help enable um, the type of solutions we need here. We also really need the private sector Mm. and cities are slow. Um, That's just part of the the reality of, of working with city government. And so we're really trying to work with both at the same time where we can enable public-private partnerships, and more private companies to be able to actually take off this wood waste so that all the pressure there is not just on cities to actually solve this problem. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I saw that you got that grant, which is huge, $200,000, right? Um, 
It was great. That's that's amazing. So you've got three, would you call that a pilot program then? Three city pilot program, basically? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And how what how has the response been from these cities? Have they said, this is great, you're solving a problem for us? Or were they hesitant? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that's really noteworthy is, so we get this grant, right? And we have this opportunity now to go take and, and solve and understand this problem in cities. We put out a, a request for proposals. So we say, hey, cities across the country, like, we think you have this problem. Come tell us if you do. And, you know, do you want to work with us? Do you want us to go in and understand it? We had 31 cities apply um, from across the country, which we were like really shocked by. So most of the major municipalities all across the country, lots of mid-sized cities some smaller cities as well. Um, and we did like not a ton like putting this out. Um, you know, we, we weren't like super well networked with cities at that point. It was really early stage for us. And we were like, wow, that's a real indication that there's so much demand here. And the reason for it is it provides so much value to cities. So it provides a waste solution, which is cost savings. So that's immediate dollars back into a general fund um, and back into city pockets, which is huge. And especially with constrained city budgets, that matters a lot. It's also really powerful jobs creation. And that's one of the things we get really excited about is when you create the correct type of urban forestry infrastructure in cities. So to manage your trees well, to be able to plant new trees, and in particular, to be able to manage the trees that are coming down through milling infrastructure and some other parts of that, you create a ton of jobs. And so this is really awesome opportunity to bring in economic development and jobs creation into the climate conversation. And that's really the last piece is it's really climate beneficial. So as you see more cities have climate targets and net zero targets, um, it fits really, really well with those initiatives. This is just right up my alley. I love these kinds of win, 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 wins, right? Yeah, exactly. That's my favorite thing on this show is finding things that just are, appear to be better from all angles, all points yep. of view. And this certainly seems like that. You're solving a number of problems at once and you're benefiting the world. Yep. Truly, truly an incredible concept. Um, I, I, I love the thought of this. So maybe explain to our listeners, what is the process, the ideal process that you see happening with these trees? A great point. So normally when a tree comes down in a city, um, it's coming down for things we talked about, for weather, it's old, for pest risk, um, or it's, you know, it's diseased, uh, or it's, it's part of a planned removal uh, because there's a new building coming in or something like that. And so as soon as that's happening, Oftentimes, those things can be predicted. Um, so it starts with knowing what's happening first and getting our data really aligned. So that's with cities, that's with private tree care companies, that's with things like being able to understand the impacts of storms. And that starts with having really good data on your tree canopy. So you need to know what trees are there, you need to know how old they are, you need to know what condition they're in. That also helps you keep them alive for longer, which is ultimately really the goal here. As you know that, you can predict more effectively what's going to happen to those trees. Once you do, um, you are able to start thinking about how can we be being ready to, to salvage that wasted material that is going to come down. And so as we prepare for that, you want private companies as well as the city to be ready to take these trees down in a way that actually enables reuse. So oftentimes when you see somebody take down a tree, they cut it into these really short sections. I've seen it's that. It's hard to turn that. Yeah, exactly. They're called cookies. They're not delicious. Um, it's really <laughs> hard. <laughs> For right a now. second, I was like, okay, we're bringing it back full circle. Cookies. Somebody said cookies. If they called I them donuts. I was getting excited too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can't do anything out of that, right? It's this short little stump. And so it starts with the actual taking down. So that's building the capacity and the knowledge within those folks. And so instead, you'd be producing bigger logs, which then can be taken to local processing facilities, whether that's a city or a private company that can turn that into primary processed material. So you can think about a slab or dimensional lumber, and then connecting in with secondary producers. So furniture manufacturers, flooring manufacturers, you can pretty much do anything. I mean, I've got some wood behind you or behind me here in the shot, it, yes. and it's, you can use it for anything. It's amazing. It can be a cutting board. It can be a massive ceiling, you know, insulation, it can be a table, like it really has a lot of different uses. And so then it would be used. Um, the next piece of that for us is 15% of all of our profits get reinvested back into city trees. So we work with local planting organizations to help support the maintenance of existing trees and also to get a lot of new trees in the ground. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the best case scenario, which is 
a lot of different stakeholders working together. Um, and that's why we call ourselves a platform. And that's the, the technology that we're really bringing to the table to make that efficient. So we've got a lot of different coordinating entities that need to work well together to pass this material along and get it to market. And that's what we help really, really um, make happen. Well, hello there, Timmy. Today we'll be talking about wood. All right! No, not that kind of wood, Timmy. You prepubescent scamp. Ah, shucks. Look, can you at least tell me where wood comes from? You see, Timmy, wood is used in all kinds of everyday products like tables, paneling, cabinets. I asked you where it comes from, not what it is, you idiot. <laughs> Sorry, Timmy. Well, you see, wood comes from as far away as possible, destroying forests that we need, that we need to live. And then it's shipped on giant boats that burn a whole bunch of crap, and it takes weeks to get to you. That's how you know it's good quality wood. Huh, that sounds weird. What if instead we set up a sustainable marketplace whereby buyers and sellers could interact to repurpose urban wood that would otherwise have gone to waste, creating valuable products while dramatically reducing carbon footprints and making better use of numerous resources that we already have? Oh, Timmy, you know so little about the world. So Absolutely. the tree is harvested, hopefully responsibly, and then it gets sent off. You collect your, your cut. And then at the end of all of this, planting trees is the final step. So how yep. do we do that? Do you plant a tree exactly where there was one before, one for one, or what's the thought on planting? Yeah, so lots of times when you look at folks who are planting right now, they're sort of doing this $1 per tree model, which is really problematic in lots of ways, um, because trees are more expensive than that, um, especially in any sort of city or peri-urban context, so the area surrounding cities. And again, there's lots of value. It's great to be helping support rural reforestation, but we also really want to be supporting reforestation where it really matters to people. And that's more expensive. Um, so we are focused on, you know, really giving back. So if you buy, let's say you buy a table from us, um, from a tree that was found in Baltimore, we will then work with the Baltimore Tree Trust um, to facilitate new planting back in Baltimore. An important piece is we're not just focused on tree replacement, because if you just do tree replacement, you end up with the same inequitable tree canopies that we have right now. So if you look at like an aerial view of most cities in the U.S., you will see the trees are really aligned and are mostly in wealthier, whiter neighborhoods, right? They're yes. places where often communities. Certainly yeah, true crazy. here. Certainly true yep. in the greater Los Angeles area. It's totally true. And yeah. so tree canopy maps really match redlining, you know, where communities of color were, you know, really intentionally excluded from being able to own property. And it's awful. Um, and so what we're really focused on is something called tree equity, which is helping to facilitate and working with communities to plant trees, um, you know, with communities that don't have them because there's so many benefits of trees. Yeah. It's cooler. It's beautiful. It's property value. Like there's all these energy savings that you can get, like all of these things. And so many communities are just left out of that. So we're really working with organizations that help facilitate that. And I think the last thing I would say there too is for us as a national organization, like we don't want to go into a community and tell them this is where you should plant a tree. We want to work with a local organization that is part of that community that says, hey, we need more trees here. And we are ready to take care of them and we're ready to grow that. And so that's something that we're really focused on as well is, is getting that right rather than being prescriptive. Well, I am completely smitten. You're saying all the right things. <laughs> Everything is great. I love this. Man, am I glad we connected today. Um, it's great. You said your goal is to plant 1 billion trees in the U.S. by 2030. That seems like an insane number. Is that as insane as it seems? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I think that is something that we had put out initially. Um, we are focused now, and again, this comes from a number of different spaces, on really driving urban and peri-urban reforestation. So I did a lot of initial analysis on this. There's about 60 billion new trees that could be planted in the U.S. So there's a lot, uh, which is a huge opportunity, and we should be going after it. Our goal is to really create a consistent revenue stream that you can then do that off of. And so that's what we're really trying to build. Um, we'll see if we get there, if we go to scale in the kind of way that we can, if this becomes a national initiative and we grow, you know, at the same pace that we're growing and are able to take this across the country, 
that's something that's um, it's it's achievable. It's it's out there, uh, but it's a really ambitious goal. Um, so we're working with a lot of partners like One Tree. One T.org, um, as well as American Forest and a number of these other folks to also help facilitate that type of uh, ambitious goal as well. I'm blown away. You got a big fan in your corner. I'm very <laughs> glad we met. Uh, I wish you nothing but success. For those listening, the website is cambiumcarbon.com. That's C A M as in Mary B I U M carbon.com. Support this man, Ben Christensen. <laughs> Do whatever you can, spread the word. And to you, Ben, I say again, thank you. Keep on Thanks. rocking. Keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right track, clearly. And I will continue to observe and cheer you on from afar. So Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for the conversation. And yeah, let's, let's go build this together. Sounds good. And with that, the official podcast is over. You don't get too many like that. That was an incredible episode. My mind is blown. Again, it seems so simple when you think about it. When you hear him explain it, it all seems so easy. But of course, it takes real genius to come up with these easy things. What I love about it is, is that it's finding something for free, something for nothing, something that a lot of people just wrote off, something that a lot of people didn't think about. I think that the great solutions of tomorrow are all going to be things like this, harvesting things from unexpected sources, so that we don't have to just build forests and chop them down and ship them all around the world. There are alternatives to a lot of the stuff. We just have to embrace them. And the only way that you can help and you can help people embrace these kinds of stories is by sharing this story. Share it with somebody who needs to hear it. Share it on your Facebook. Share it on your Instagram. Share the post. Subscribe on YouTube. Leave a comment. Rate the show five stars. If you believe in these missions, if you believe in these people, do anything you can to help the podcast grow, and I'll be really appreciative of it. As always, this is the Beat the Off and Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer, and I will see you next Friday.